So this is going to be the lecture video for chapter three, which is over ancient Egypt from Narmer to Cleopatra. So let me make that bigger. These are the learning objectives. You'll find these in the beginning of the chapter in your book. Definitely read through them before you start the chapter, um, before you start your reading, just to make sure you know what you're kind of supposed to be learning. Um, I'm not going to cover them because it takes me too long to read through that list. So um, so most of the art that the Egyptians left behind was meant to glorify the gods and was typically commissioned by the highest members of society. So like scribes, priests, and then obviously the um, Egyptian kings as well. <clears throat> and Egyptian kings in ancient Egyptian society, they were considered to be divine. So that's a little different than other cultures at the time. Um, so the kings were considered to be gods. And a lot of resources were allocated to building huge monuments in ancient Egyptian culture. And these were to honor the gods and the Egyptian god kings. And they were typically these monuments were decorated tombs that had a lot of um, decoration on the inside, and then also a lot of decorative objects that they've left behind for us to study, which is what makes looking at ancient Egyptian so art so interesting. Um, and the tombs were supposed to be the eternal home to the king god after his death. So he was going to live in this tomb, um, in, in his tomb after death. And the Egyptians were absolutely obsessed with death. Even the lower class Egyptians aspired to a, a good afterlife, and that's why they, you know, embalmed the, the, their bodies to try and preserve their bodies because they believed that each person possessed a ka, which is um, basically a spirit, and you know your spirit resided in your dead corpse after you were um, deceased. So that's what they believed. So that's why they embalmed their bodies and tried to preserve their bodies as best they could. And so their tombs were kind of like their eternal home for the Ka as well, or the spirit um, of the human that, does, that had, was now deceased. So we can see here, the, this is a papyrus scroll and it was found um, in the tomb of Hunifer, who was an important royal scribe. And this is called the Illustrated Book of the Dead. It's made out of papyrus. It's from the 19th dynasty, so a little bit later in Egyptian art. It's just a good example of what we would find in a tomb. And it's basically spells and prayers needed to secure a happy afterlife. That's what's contained in the Book of the Dead. And this is just a detail of it. It's actually 18, a little over 18 feet long and a little over a foot tall. So at the top, we can see Hunifer is kneeling before a row of deities or gods, you know, putting his hands up in respect. And then here he's being led by the jackal-headed god, um, Anubis, who is the god of embalming. And then he leads him into the Hall of Judgment. So I'm guessing this is the Hall of Judgment here. And so um, Anubis is actually weighing Hunifer's heart in this jar and weighing it against a feather. And if the heart happens to be lighter than the feather, then that means you led a good life and that you will be granted eternal life in your afterlife. And luckily his is definitely um, light enough. So he's being led here by the falcon headed God, um, Horus. And he's being led to the green-faced god Osiris here and his sister Isis and Nephthys. So um, this is the ibis-headed god here. Um, and he is a scribe and he um, is Toth. And he he's recording the proceedings. And then this crocodile creature um, is the hybrid crocodile hippopotamus lion, Amit. And he eats the heart of those who don't pass the, the test. So so this is the map of ancient Egypt here. So it's a little confusing um, because the Nile actually flows from the interior of Africa out into the Mediterranean Sea. 
So Upper Egypt is actually south and Lower Egypt is north. So they're kind of reversed as to what you'd think, but it actually has to do with the flow of the Nile River. The upper part of the Nile River is to the south and the lower part is to the north. So that's kind of why they're reversed, basically. So there was a lot of cultures that flourished at the banks of the Nile. Uh, crops did really well at the Nile, um, especially in Lower Egypt, where a lot of the deposits from the interior of Africa, the really rich hills, the Nile carried a lot of silt in the water, very muddy. And when it flooded these um, lands down here, it just deposits all of this really rich salt, uh, silt from the interior of Africa. So crops do really well um, in the Nile River deposits. And so it was very um, a very important place for growing things. And that's partially why people did so well here and why um, we get the culture of ancient Egypt. So I'm just going to go over the things that they grew in this area. So wheat was definitely a main staple. It's what they ate. They made bread and beer with it. And a lot of areas of the world also bought wheat from ancient Egypt. And that's how partially how ancient Egypt became so wealthy is because they sold their grain and traded their grain to other parts of the world. Flax was also used to make linen for clothing. So flax is um, a type of I believe it's a type of grass, and they make linen cloth out of that, and that's what they typically wore. That's what the ancient Egyptians wore. And papyrus was another plant, and this actually grew wild along the shores of the um, Nile, but they grew it as well. And they made paper, baskets, ropes, sandals out of papyrus, so that was kind of an important crop for them as well. So basically the land that dotted the Nile was um, Kind of consisted of marshes, a lot of really tall papyrus plants. I mean, I think they would reach over your head. There'd be hippos, you know, swimming in the water. Um, it would flood every year, like I mentioned. Um, so the fertility of G Egypt was very um, famous, even back in antiquity. And Rome eventually, you know, when Rome came into power, um, they noticed that Egypt was a very nice territory, and they eventually do take over Egypt. And um, partially because Egypt could grow grain really well, and Rome couldn't because the soil is way too rocky in Italy. So um, Rome ends up taking over Egypt eventually. So the exact history of ancient Egypt was definitely lost with time, but we've been able to piece it together pretty well with just different artifacts that we've found throughout the years here. And so we have a pretty decent idea of the chronology of ancient Egypt. And so that's what we'll be covering in this in this lecture. This is the Rosetta Stone. It's, it's definitely a very important discovery because it is basically the key to the, that we use to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. So this was found, I believe, in the 1900s, early 1900s or late 1800s. So one inscription is in Greek. And then one is in kind of a late Egyptian language. And then the last inscription is the same inscription just done in hieroglyphs. So this really helped um, scholars crack the, the hieroglyphic code. So I believe one section, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly which one's Greek, but one of them's Greek, one of them's late Egyptian, and then one of the sections is hieroglyphs. So that's how they were able to crack the code, so to speak, on hieroglyphs was the Rosetta Stone. So that was a really important discovery. And once we understood hieroglyphs, um, the, the written language of hieroglyphics, like that totally revolutionized the study of ancient Egypt. So let's talk about the pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods of ancient Egypt. And they think that the earliest evidence of ancient Egypt goes back as far as around 3500 BCE. And this is referred to as the pre-dynastic era. And this is during a time when Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt were separated into different um, territories, so they weren't united. And so Upper Egypt was definitely uh, a narrow tract of grassland that was good for hunting. And then Lower Egypt, which was closer to the Mediterranean, was great land for animal husbandry, which is like, you know, herding and um, also agriculture. And the majority of finds of this era come from actually Upper Egypt. 
which is actually south in the hunting area of Egypt, I guess. So this is the back of the palette of King Narmer, um, Egypt pre-dynastic period, 3000 to 2920 BCE, and it's made out of slate. It's about two feet, one inch high. Um, Hierakonpolis is where it was found in Egypt, and that's a kind of an important place. Um, and this is an important pre-dynastic um, period piece. And it's one of the earliest historical works found having to do with ancient Egyptian culture. And it's probably a record of events that took place during the unification of the two kingdoms of Egypt. So upper and lower Egypt actually being unified. And the stone was definitely a utilitarian object used to store eye makeup. And the eye makeup was worn by both men and women in ancient Egypt to enhance their appearance, but it also um, helped with the glare of the sun from the um, with the glare from the sun. So if we look at the other side of this, you can see the circular depression where they would mix the powder and the water or whatever, you know, if, if they used oil and they would mix their eye makeup in here and, the, and it would be stored there as well in this, in this area here, in this circular depression. And it would probably be laid flat on some sort of surface. And this is a great the thing to look at because it shows a formula for figure representation that would be used in Egyptian art for the next 3000 years. So a lot of the figures in here, this is setting the precedence of how things are going to go for the next 3000 years. And it's pretty amazing that Egyptian art for a 3000 year period of time was able to have such a consistent look to it. Um, that's kind of unheard of these days, partially because of technology, but, um, so at the top of each palette are the heads of a cow. You can see that there. Um, on the back, the king is wearing a um, crown of Upper Egypt, and a guy is washing his foot, his feet here. Um, I think that's the foot washer, actually. And he's holding the, the hair of his enemy, and he's about to bash his enemy in with a club, which is kind of a, you know, important thing in Egyptian culture is that the king is kind of represented as this great warlord. He's very, you know, um, he's violent, you know, a lot of violent behavior. So um, on, the, on the front, we can see the intertwining necks of these two creatures here, the lions. And that is probably symbolic of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And in the uppermost register of this side, Narmer is wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. So he's wearing the Lower Egyptian crown here. Um, and then on the other one, he's wearing the Upper Egyptian crown. So he's using, he's wearing both crowns. And then we have the unification of the symbol of that. So um, that's what they think that this is kind of representing is that he's smiting his enemies. He's unifying uh, Upper and Lower Egypt and he's wearing both crowns on this piece. And they're using registers to separate um, the composition up. So these bands that run across, and then there's a separate scene in each band. And that's another convention that we're gonna be seeing a lot of um, in ancient Egyptian art. So, and also we can see that there's a combination of views when we look at Narmer. Um, we, his torso is frontal, but his head is to the side, and then his eye is also frontal. So we have that, you know, that twisted, per perspective that would kind of be um, standard in Egyptian art as well. And we saw that in Mesopotamia as well, just like that combination of views um, in figure representation that characterized this art, um, the frontal views, the side views, just all mixed together. So it's not a realistic um, representation of a human body. It's more of a conceptual idea than it is a realistic or optical view of the human body. So moving on. So this is a Mastaba tomb. These are really early um, tombs, tomb types in ancient Egypt. It was basically a rectangular brick or stone structure with sloping slides. And it was typically constructed over an underground burial chamber or a series of different underground burial chambers.